I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been my joy to be here at your church in the prayer conference, prayer seminar that began Friday night, two sessions Friday night, four sessions yesterday until about 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. And now in some sense, this is an independent message, but in another sense, it is the uh, final aspect of that prayer conference. I'm happy that a number of my books are here. My latest book, Revival Fire, the thrilling story of revival, primarily in the last three centuries in various parts of the world. It will be available here in the country sometime within this coming month. It is off the press about a month ago. It's on the way someplace between the United States and New Zealand right now. And I hope you will all be able to take a copy of it. The first book the Lord led me to write was Touch the World Through Prayer. Already in the aisle right over there, a brother said to me, in my life, this book has been next to the Bible. I have had hundreds and hundreds of testimonies of how God has used this. I hope you, if you don't have a copy, you will get one. Over 300,000 copies around the world in 31 languages or nations. And it just keeps extending further and further. A manual on intercessory prayer. The second book I wrote was because so many Christians seem to have a problem in understanding God's will in their life. And that I felt so many only thought of God's will in connection with the big events of life, marriage, life, work, so on. When God wants to bless us and guide us in everything, the Bible says the Lord will guide you always. That means daily. So I wrote this book, Let God Guide You Daily. The little decisions of life on which often great things hinge. Let Him guide you in your praying, in your witnessing, in your purchasing so you save money, in your travel, in all sorts of events of life. The next book I wrote was Ablaze for God. Oh, that every one of us were really ablaze for God. As I was writing this, I was planning to call it A Flame for God. And one night as I was praying, I thought, well, a flame flickers up and down. That isn't what I want. I want a steady blazing fire for God. So I changed the title, A Blaze for God. How the Holy Spirit can use you in leadership, lay leadership, youth leadership, children's leadership, missionary leadership, lay any form of service for the Lord. In fact, many people who consider themselves, quote, only laymen, tell me this is the best book that I ever wrote. And then I realized there were those situations in life that do not easily yield to answers to prayer. Perhaps there are some of you here who have been praying for three years or two months and you don't have an answer yet for a situation. What more can we do to get important answers to the prayers and the cries of our heart? And so I wrote the book, Mighty Prevailing Prayer. And we've been talking about the last two days, how to get your prayer more mighty, more effective, more God glorifying, how you can get more answers to your prayer. The last book that I wrote that I have here was this book, Measure Your Life. Do you know, I have been amazed. I am now 78 years of age. I don't think I've heard more than one sermon in my life on the time when Christians stand at the judgment throne of Christ. A lot of reference to when the sinners stand there. But if we come to Christ with repentance, the sins we bring to the cross, we leave. And they will never be mentioned against us again. We do not face our sins at the judgment throne of Christ if we belong to Christ. That's been taken care of. But we will, every one of us, stand before the judgment throne of Christ to be judged and then rewarded eternally for how we invested our life after we were born again. And do you know, millions of Christians are just living 
and don't think about investing themselves for God and His cause. And God is planning such tremendous rewards throughout the ages of eternity. It's His great joy because we're His children. He wants to bestow on us and heaven will not be the same for everybody. Oh, we will all share the joy and the glory and the light and the beauty and the music and all of that. But there will be individual rewards. Your reward will be different from mine. Mine will be different from yours. That reward will be according to how we have prayed, how we have served, how we have loved. Yes, I have mentioned here 17 ways to evaluate your life from God's perspective. He will reward you for what your thought life has been. Have you been thinking about Jesus? Have you been thinking about the suffering world? Have you been thinking about the prisoners for Christ's sake that are in prison today? Your thought life. Your words. How much have your words glorified Jesus? Do you use your words every day to someone to glorify Jesus? How God will reward you for your sacrifice, for the world dimension, and so on and so on. These are all available at bargain prices, and I hope you get a copy of every one. An investment I don't think you'll regret. Many people who first bought one or two, and then they want all the rest of them. And so I pray God will make them a blessing. I don't keep one dollar from the sale of my books. Everything about the actual cost goes to help print editions in poorer third world countries. They're in Russia. 50,000 of them. They're inside mainland China. Been carried in there and others will be carried in. Your buying the books helps get other books out around the world in 31 different languages or nations. And now I hope that I will give what is God's most important message for you for today. I read from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Paul's telling us the prayer he prays for the Ephesian church, beginning with verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. The next verse, for the church. Do you understand why it's important that Jesus is head over all the world, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, for the church? We're going to look at that this morning which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And drop down to verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Some 30 years ago, when the British government was planning Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's official state visit to India, they began a year in advance, and they decided she would have one Sunday in India. And they decided they would have her spend that Sunday in Varanasi, the old Hindu Banaras, which was just about 90 miles from where we lived in Allahabad. And there was only one Church of England church there, so she would be attending St. Mary's Church. A year in advance. People came from Buckingham Palace. They looked the church over. They said, your old faded strip of carpet down the aisle is not fit for the queen to walk on. You've got to put in new carpet this year. 
He said, look, your church looks too barren here on the outside. You've got to put some nice shrubs here on the outside, some flowers. You beautify it up a little bit, so on and so on. And they made all the other plans about her state visit. Well, we were thrilled because that Anglican church was pastored by a born-again, spirit-filled, Keswick background, dear brother in Christ, Bob Harlan, dear friend of mine and others. And it just so happened that his associate pastor had been sent to us for training. He had been my student, had graduated from our OMS seminary, and it just so happened that almost every member of the choir was a member of a missionary society that was evangelical through and through, staff members. So we said, praise the Lord, the Queen's going to be able to worship in that church. Now the bishop thought, oh, what a privilege I'm going to have. I'll be preaching to Her Majesty the Queen. About one month before the arrival, there came a letter from Buckingham Palace. The Queen desires no special service. She wants to be a part of the regular congregational service of the church. So that meant the bishop was out. And that meant the pastor, my dear brother Bob Harlan, was going to be the one who was going to preach to the queen. Oh, we began to pray, Lord bless Bob. Lord give Bob just the message. The bishop said to me, now Wesley, I'm sorry I can't give you a ticket for St. Mary's Church. Well, I said, look, I didn't ask for a ticket. He said, I know. But he said, you see, that only seats 330 people, and every third person in the church has to be a secret police. And he said, every British official in India, and that, you see, was years ago when there were British officials there in greater number. He said, everyone wants to be present from the High Commissioner on down. And he said, Vijaya Lakshmi Pundit, President, uh, Premier Nehru's sister, who used to be the President of the United Nations, she wants to be there. Indira Gandhi wants to be there. The Maharaja of Benares, great Hindu officials, all want to be in the church at that time. I wouldn't dare let an American in. I said, that's all right. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pitch a tent right out in front of the church, an awning, and I'm going to give you a ticket, your family, to sit in the tent. Well, I said, thank you, Bishop, that's very kind of you. Then one week before the royal arrival, there came one more note to the pastor. Your sermon is to be 12 minutes in length. Oh, we said, Lord help Bob Harlan. How is he going to give the kind of message you want him to give in 12 minutes time? The time came. We got there early in the morning. I brought my tripod my movie camera, that was before we had automatic focusing cameras. I wanted the secret police to know who I was so they wouldn't be disturbed by anything I did. So I brought out my tripod and set it down, put my camera on top, pulled out my exposure meter to measure the light in one or two places so they would see the gestures I would be making. And the bishop walked up in all his beautiful robes. Uh, it was nice to talk. Now I said, Bishop, when the Queen talks to me, what do I say? She looked at me. You don't speak to royalty until royalty speaks to you. And you don't ask anything of royalty. You only answer royalty. And besides, the first time she speaks, you have to say, Your Majesty. About, he got about that far, then he realized it was a joke. So he smiled and I smiled. Of course, I wasn't going to speak to the Queen, but uh, at least I learned something very important. Here promptly at the right time, here came the procession of military vehicles, and then Her Majesty's car, and my, I was standing with my movie camera ready, so right in front of me, about 10 feet in front of me, the Queen and Philip got out, and the Bishop was there, and the pastor was there, and my former student, the associate pastor, were there greeting the royal party. I got them standing there, and as they went into the church, my, that service went fast. I was praying the whole time, oh, Lord, use this service. Lord, help Bob. Anoint him. Use him this morning. Philip read the, the scripture lesson. My former student led in the prayers. 
And then Bob began to speak. He said, there is a way to contact heaven. He said, you can talk to God. You see, I'm talking about prayer this morning. He said, but what does it mean to be a child of God? He said, it doesn't mean to be the member of the Church of England or any other church. That doesn't make you a child of God. It doesn't mean to be baptized. That doesn't make you a child of God. He said, it doesn't mean to be faithful to the church and come every Sunday or to support the church. with." He said, you have to be born again. He said, you must repent of your sins. Oh, I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Quietly, but in my heart, I was just rejoicing. Oh, Lord, help me. He was giving a regular Billy Graham message. He preached the gospel there like everything. And I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Help him, Lord. Help him. Bless him. Use him, Lord. Bless him. I was so absorbed in it, I hardly realized when the, I could hear them singing the closing hymn, a benediction. And here came the royal party to the door of the church, you know, 50 feet in front of me where I was sitting. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, so I stood up right away to my camera, but I was still praising. Oh, Lord, don't let any of those people miss the message. Lord, use it to all those Hindus and Mohammedans and the secret police. Lord, bless. Oh, use it. Praise her name. Praise her name. I thought, my, she's getting big in the viewfinder. I looked up. <laughs> she had come and was standing right in front of me. And I was so absorbed praying that I hadn't realized what was happening. She said, are you a missionary? I said, yes. She said, what, what society are you with? I told her. She said, what is it, your ministry? I told her I'm the principal of a theological school training Indian Christian young people to be pastors of Indian Christian churches. So on. your majesty, I said. It just suddenly dawned on me that I was supposed to have said your majesty. She smiled with that little dimple which is in her cheek and you may not know it's there. It doesn't show up on the pictures. And then they were gone. I got them as they left. And as soon as the royal party was out the churchyard, just like that, in the meantime, everybody had emptied from the church and they were all standing there watching her talk to me. And as soon as she was gone, the Britishers came from over. Why did she talk to you? Why did she talk to you? Why did she talk to you? I said, I don't know why she talked to me. I wasn't expecting her to speak to me. But maybe I know why she talked to me. To tell you. Did you hear what I said? You don't speak to royalty until royalty speaks to you. And you don't ask anything from royalty. You only answer royalty. But did you know that the sovereign of this universe, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, said, and I preached on it yesterday, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Do you realize that you and I, as children of the Lord, are the most privileged creatures on this earth. Any time, day or night, we don't have to wait for a word or anything. We can talk direct to God. Are we making use of the privileges that God has given us to commune with God, to intercede with God? I'm going to speak to you this morning on reigning with Christ. Or another title, in other words, would be the Trinity of Intercession. Now, you and I all understand the Trinity of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But do you understand the Trinity of intercession? God the Father never intercedes. He is the God who hears all prayer. Who constitutes the Trinity of intercession? First of all, is God the Son. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our great high priest. Do you remember that in the passage it said that Jesus has been raised to heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father. Did you know that that is repeated over and over and over in God's word? When Jesus was on trial just before the cross, Pilate tried to get him to talk. Herod tried to get him to talk. The high priest tried to get Jesus to talk. And Jesus stood there in silence. 
And finally, in exasperation, the high priest used the legal form for court oaths. And he said to Jesus, I quote from the King James Version, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you be the Son of God or no. Could Jesus remain silent then? No. On the most solemn moment of his life, for an official answer to the whole Jewish nation, through their high priest and Sanhedrin, who were all seated there, he was put on legal oath. He must tell whether or not he was the Son of God. And Jesus responded instantly, I am. He didn't say, I am the Son of God. Did you hear what he said? I am. Do you remember when Moses met God at the burning bush and God commissioned him? Well, he said, how will the people believe me? Who shall I tell them has sent me? And God said, I am. That is my name forever. And the high priest was aghast. This person standing before me dares to claim to be Jehovah. I am. And there on oath, Jesus really swore that to three things. His deity, I am the Son of God. His sovereignty, you, Mr. High Priest, you, members of the Sanhedrin, you, people in Tauranga, you, people who are sitting here today, you will all see me seated at the right hand of God the Father. He will be the sovereign of the ages. And the third thing, and you will see me coming on the clouds of heaven. He on oath swore legally, I am the Son of God. You will see me in my sovereign role, and you will see me coming on the clouds of heaven. Yes, every eye will see him. Did Jesus go to the right hand of the Father? Did he take his seat? Oh, yes. Luke 22, 69. Jesus said, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated. That means until 1995. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. Mark says it this way. He was taken up to heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. Are you noticing what I'm repeating? These are the words of Scripture. Sat down, right hand, God, the throne of God, the majesty, some similar word there. Hebrews 1, 3. After he provided purification from sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why does the Bible repeat 13 times almost identical words? Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty or the God, the Father, or the throne, some such word there. Something God doesn't want us to overlook. Something God wants us to be firmly convinced of. Something God wants us to understand 13 times. In Hebrews 8, 1, the writer of the Hebrews says, the point of what we are saying is this. If you haven't caused us for the point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. What is the point? The point is this, that Jesus is seated, first of all. Do you know who seats, who sits in a throne room? Only the emperor, the king. 
no one, there's no other seat in the throne room. In the ancient empires, the chief minister or maybe one other minister or two could be summoned into the king's presence. And when they came, they stood. Only the emperor sat. To be seated in the throne room was to be seated on the throne, was to be the sovereign yourself. So Jesus is told to us 13 times that he is seated and that he is seated on the throne. And which throne? The throne beside God the Father on the right hand. The right hand is the place of honor of God the Father in heaven. So this is something very, very important. What is he doing sitting on the throne? Very obvious, he's reigning. But how is he reigning? Did you notice? The point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest. He is seated as in a dual capacity, as high priest and as sovereign. Only one in history, sovereign high priest, high priest sovereign. What is Jesus' priority today? Is it greeting saints when they reach heaven? No. Oh, yes, Jesus stood up when uh, Stephen, the martyr, came to heaven. Oh, yes, I'm sure Jesus greets every one of his children when they arrive in heaven. But that's not his, he's glad to do that, but that's not his priority. That's not his main concern. Well, what's he doing? Enjoying the heavenly concerts and the music of the angels? Oh, I'm sure he enjoys that, but that's not his priority. What does the Bible say? He ever lives to do what? Intercede for us. What does that mean? That doesn't mean he's not trying to tell us that he's always alive. That's said elsewhere. Of course he's alive. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He cannot but be alive forevermore. He is life itself. But the point is not that. The point is, he lives to intercede. Now, if you hear said about your pastor, that he lives for his church, you know what that means. You know that his big concern, he's always thinking about you, his congregation. You know that he's loving you. You know, every time he prays, he's praying for you. You know, his whole concern is, he's living for you. When you hear that a mother lives for her family, you know what that means. Oh, of course she has to iron, she has to cook, but she is living for her family. That's her priority, that's her delight, that's her joy, that's her thrill. She is living for her family. You've heard that so-and-so lives for their music. But Jesus lives to intercede. The great delight of the Son of God today is to be our high priest, to intercede. He is living to intercede. Now what does the high priest do? The, human, the Hebrew high priests were all typical, pointing to the real high priest, Jesus Christ. The high priest did two things. He offered sacrifices and he made intercession. Now, at the cross, Jesus offered the sacrifice that ended all sacrifice. He offered the sacrifice of himself on the cross. That every sacrifice from the Garden of Eden on had pointed forward to. And on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And it's finished. Do you know any place in the world where a Jew offers sacrifices today? It's finished. No need of any further sacrifices. Oh, we talk about spiritually, we talk about the sacrifice of joy and the sacrifice of thanksgiving and like that. But real sacrifice in the biblical primary initial meaning of the term was culminated 
and accomplished once and for all. We have a finished work of Christ. But there is an unfinished work of Christ. And what is that? Intercession. He is our high priest. Do you remember the high priest in the Old Testament? He had to always wear his official garb. And he didn't have a committee design that garb. God prescribed exactly how the high priest was to be officially garbed. God told them that that white long robe and over it something like a vest and on the front of that God said there is to be four rows of three jewels each. On every jewel the name of one of the tribes of Israel. And that piece of cloth nine inches wide, 18 inches long, and then folded up and on the front. And so the high priest was always to have on his heart the people, the names of the people, symbolizing he in love serves them as their high priest. God so loved the world. And to make it very clear, God told Moses exactly how it was to be fastened. He said, fasten it with gold chains around his body so that it not swing out. The Bible clearly says that. Never is there to be one inch between the breastplate, as it was called, with the names of the people. Never one inch separating that from the heart. The high priest was always had close to his heart the people for whom he was officially the high priest. Oh, what a beautiful picture. That was but a symbol point to Jesus. Jesus has you and me on his heart. He is the high priest on the right hand of God the Father today, and he has us on his heart. Praise God. That wasn't all. On this shoulder, there was to be a flat stone sewn into the cloth. And on that flat stone, the names of six of the tribes of Israel. And on this shoulder, another onyx stone with six names engraved. Not only was there he to keep us on his heart, but he shouldered the responsibility for his people. And Jesus takes the responsibility for your life and mine as our high priest. He is living to intercede for all of our needs. Realize it. Rejoice in the fact he is our great high priest, praise God. So the unfinished work of Christ is his work as high priest. And he lives to intercede. And he has entered heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. And he is the great amen. That is one of his names in the Bible you find in the book of Revelation. What does that mean? That means that every time you pray a prayer, According to the will of God, Jesus says, Amen. We'll look at that again in just a moment or two. So, the number one intercessor of the universe is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, who is number two? If there's a trinity of intercession, who is number two? Praise God, that's the Holy Spirit. We read all about it in Romans chapter 8. Have you often said, I wish I knew how to pray about this. I just don't know quite what to ask God. Now, God knew we were going to be that way. And the Bible acknowledges the fact. In fact, let me read to you Romans 8, 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We are weak. What in? We do not know what we ought to pray for. So that's why the Holy Spirit is our counselor and our guide. You remember Jesus said, I will send you another. The Greek word is parakletos. In the King James Version, it is translated comforter. In some versions, it is translated helper. In other versions, like the New International, it's translated counselor. You see, the Greek word parakletos 
is so rich in meaning, so full of meaning, you can't describe it all in any one English word. So you have to choose, well, which word shall we use to express what's here? Of course he comforts us. Of course he helps us. Of course he strengthens us. Of course he counsels us. But I remember that in the Old Testament, when it was prophesied about the coming of Jesus, and his name shall be, what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So Jesus is our wonderful Counselor. But Jesus was leaving to go back to heaven. And he said, I will give you another. Yes, I have been your paracletos. I have been your comforter. I have been your helper. I have been your counselor. But now I'm going to give you another one, and he will abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth. So, the Holy Spirit is our counselor in residence in our heart to guide us and to help us. And when we don't know how we ought to pray, the Holy Spirit is with us to help us and to guide us in our praying. Back to the title of my book, Let God Guide You Daily. He wants to guide you in your praying as you pray for your family, as you pray for your pastor, as you pray for your church, as you pray for your nation, as you pray for your neighborhood. He wants to guide you. Did he remind you already this morning of someone or something to pray about? That's his, that's his work. He does that if you are sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, praise God. I'll read that again. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. You know, James and John didn't know. When Jesus was coming through Samaria on his way to Jerusalem, and the Samaritan people disdained and wouldn't leave him alone to stay overnight, get up, get up, get up, you can't, you can't stay here in our village. James and John became so angry, they said, Lord, shall we call down fire out of heaven like Elijah and burn him up? Jesus said, you don't know what kind of spirit you have. Jesus didn't come to burn people up. He came to save people. James and John didn't know how they ought to pray. Even Paul didn't always know how he ought to pray. You remember Paul had a thorn in his flesh. Something very painful. There is speculation of what that thorn was. We can't guarantee we know, but we can get, come pretty close to knowing. We know that there was serious oriental eye diseases rampant at that time. We know what Paul said. We know that he did not write his own letters. A secretary wrote his letters, but he signed them. You remember he said on one occasion, you see what large letters I am using as I sign. So he had to write the big letters. I guess that's the best he could do he could, so he could see what he was doing. You know what, in another place he said to the Galatians, he said, I bear you record. You treat me like an angel of God. If you could, you would have plucked your eyes out and given them to me. Yes, he had a painful eye problem. He had very poor eyesight. And so Paul said, three times, I asked the Lord to take away that thorn in my flesh. But what did God say? My grace is sufficient. Even Paul didn't know what was best. So it's not surprising if you and I don't always know. But praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit always knows. Not only does he guide us what to pray, but let me complete the verse. The Bible says, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. So there's the second intercessor. The Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us. Now, how does he intercede? Now, Lord, here's Brother Smith. He's going to have a busy week this week. Help him, help him with his work. Help him with the family. May he have a good weekend. Here's little Nancy in the third grade at school. She's going to have an arithmetic test. Help Nancy. 
with the uh, arithmetic test this week. And there's Sister Jones, you know how her hand is full with her family, all the washing she's got to do in the work. Lord, help Sister Jones. Is that the way the Holy Spirit prays for us? No. The Bible tells us how he prays for us. I didn't finish the verse. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. A lot of people think that the Holy Spirit is going to cause us to groan. What the Bible says is, He is praying with groans for us. Now, when He burdens us for things, sometimes we will groan within our hearts. And we may even groan verbally as we're praying. But that's not the primary meaning here. What He is saying is, He prays for us with groans. His own heart yearns so infinitely that no human words would be adequate to express us. Oh, Father, bless Pastor this week. Help him with those lovely people in the church. Oh, Father, give him wisdom. Father, anoint him in everything he does this week. Oh, Father, bless little Nancy. She loves you too. Oh, bless little Nancy. Help her with that arithmetic test. Help her to be a light for you in her school situation. Oh, Father, bless Brother Tom. Bless him. And he is praying with groans for you and me. The great second intercessor of the Trinity. He is praying for you and me with groans. And that isn't all. I've got more good news. What is the next verse? The Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So he is praying the highest and best thing that could ever be prayed for. He knows the will of God, and he is praying that you will find the will of God. Praise the Lord. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? You know what the next verse says? A lot of people read the next verse, and they don't see that this is one package. We do not know what we ought to pray for. We're weak. But the Spirit and himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he intercedes in accordance with God's will. In the next verse, we know, Romans 8, 28. You can quote the, the reference even to that place. How many times is it all praise God for Romans 8, 28? Well, that's tied in with the praying. That's what this is all about here. It's one package. Therefore, when the Holy Spirit is groaning and praying for you, we know that all things will work together for good. Or in another translation, we know that in all things, God will work for the good of those who have been called according to his purpose. So praise God. We can relax, can't we? God the Son is interceding for us. God the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. Isn't that enough? No, that's not enough. I said, Trinity of intercession. Well, where's the third? We're sitting in church here this morning. You. You say, me? Yes, you. I cannot tell you why, but God in his sovereign wisdom chose that the Trinity of intercession would be incomplete until you join in prayer. Why did he need us? He didn't. But he chose us. And he chose us for this role. Do you remember what First Peter t tells us? For you are a chosen generation, a what? Royal priesthood. Well, what do we need priests for today? Not to offer sacrifices. To intercede. You are to be God's special royal priest. How much of a priest have you been this week? Revelation chapter 1. He has washed us from our sins with his blood and made us to be, what does it say? Kings and priests to God. Have you acted like a king this week? Have you acted like a priest this week? Have you acted like a royal priest? You see, now we say, oh, God is so good. He has raised us from our sins. Of course he has. The Bible's clear. 
We can be crucified with Christ. We can be buried with Christ. We can be raised with Christ. Do you remember the verse I read? Back to verse 6. And he has raised us together with Christ and seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. Wait a minute. I thought I told you that no one sat in the throne room except the sovereign. How can you sit with Jesus unless you're sitting in the throne room of heaven? The Bible says that's where Jesus is seated. Thirteen times it goes over and over. And here we are told he has seated us. He has raised us for this purpose to seat us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. So you see, you are to be reigning with Jesus. By what? By doing what Jesus is doing. And what is Jesus doing? He's interceding. Jesus is not reigning today by his scepter. That day is coming. The day is coming when he will be ruling with power. There will be no more temptation. There will be no more sin. Satan will be cast out of this universe. That day is coming. But this is not that day. This is the dispensation of intercession. This is the dispensation when Jesus is high priest. We don't know his roles throughout eternity. But this dispensation, until he comes on the clouds of heaven, he will be seated at the right hand of God the Father to intercede. He is reigning by prayer, intercession. Remember before the cross, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And then he added, but I have prayed for you. Incidentally, that you is in the plural. Peter was just a representative of the other disciples and of you and me. That's the church. We are, Satan wants to sift you and me today. But Jesus is only prayed for us. Why doesn't Jesus just grab the devil and hold him and throw him away? No, not yet. That day's coming. But now, he is defeating Satan by what? Intercession. It was prophesied way back in the book of Psalms, the first of the Messianic Psalms, the Psalms about Messiah. Psalm 2 talks about how the, the kings of the earth gather together against God and their anger and all. And he who sits, sits in heaven, God the Father, laughs. He said, I've set my king upon my holy hill. And then Messiah speaks. And he says, I will declare the decree of the Lord. He, God the Father, said to me, God the Son, to me, Messiah, what? You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations. So how is Jesus going to get New Zealand? By a mighty demonstration of his power? He's going to do it by asking. How is Jesus going to stop communism? By the sword, by intercession. He is reigning by intercession. How will the Muslim world ever yield to Jesus Christ? By a crusade? No, by intercession. This is the dispensation of intercession. The dispensation of power is coming, thank God. But this is a dispensation. What is the most important work you could ever do for Christ today? Is it to go up and down every street in Tauranga and knock on every door and witness to every family about Jesus? That might be wonderful. That might be God's will for you. I don't know. The greatest thing you will ever do for Jesus will be what? To intercede. I have been praying, you have been praying already for the Billy Graham crusade this week. What is the greatest thing that Billy Graham will ever do? This week, when for the first time in human history, one man will preach to maybe as many as two billion people. Well, that's not the greatest thing. The greatest thing Billy Graham will ever do is to intercede. He, to reign with Jesus. God gives us our various assignments, but we are all given the priority assignment to be seated with Jesus on the throne of heaven. What is the most Christ-like thing you can ever do? To do the very thing that Christ is doing. And what's he doing? Intercede. 
my brothers and sisters, this is serious Christian business. This is serious Christian responsibility. Why is the world so little responsive to Christ today? Because we are not fulfilling God's priority role for us, as we ought to be. And the more the church takes unto itself the role of intercession, the more glory comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the more miracles of grace and power are manifested. And the church has forgotten. We glory in our praise of God. Beautiful. We glory in our worship of God. Beautiful. We're going to do that throughout eternity. We're not the only ones praising God. All creation, all nature praises God. The seraphim, the cherubim, and the archangels, and the angels. But do you know, there is no proof in the Bible that one heavenly angel ever has or ever will intercede. Who intercedes? The Trinity of intercession. God the Father, God the Son, and God's children. That's your role in that. I want to ask you, how much reigning have you already done this week? How much reigning did you do before you came to church this morning? Do you plan to take some time today to reign with Jesus? That's not praying for yourself. That's not reigning with Jesus. If you're sitting on the throne, you don't be absorbed in yourself and your own private interests. On the throne, you are there for the kingdom. What is Jesus' priority prayer? Jesus' pattern prayer for you and me? Teach us. Before we ever say, give us today our daily bread, we are to say, you will be done, your kingdom come. We are to, in normal praying, now there can even be emergencies when you go straight to, oh Lord, help now. But in normal praying, before we pray for ourselves, we are to pray for others, for God's word. Your will be done, your king, after this manner, according to this way, this is the way you should pray, said Jesus. Hallowed be your name, your name, your kingdom, your will, then give us, then meet our needs. May God teach us to reign as kings and priests. I am deeply distressed in America. I feel here so few pastors ever pray by name for President Clinton. I have heard it much more in Britain in the British churches when they pray for their queen. What does the Bible say? What did God say through Paul? I will first of all that prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all those in authority. What right do we have to criticize our government if we haven't been praying for the leaders? and for the government. We're to be priests. We're to sit on the throne. We're to reign with Jesus. How many times this past week did you pray for Jim Bolger? I didn't. I didn't know who was Prime Minister, in fact. I didn't. But I was praying for President Clinton. I was praying for Vice President Gore. I was praying for the nine justices of our Supreme Court by name. I was praying for our state senators, both of them. I was praying for our district representatives. I was praying for our mayor. Why? Because that's what the Bible tells me. I'm to reign with Jesus. I'm to take part of his garment of the world. Oh, may God help us as a people of God. The unsaved are not going to do it. The nominal Christians who don't have the real vitality, they're not going to do it. You and I who know the power of the prayer, you and I who know the power, we're the ones who are to reign with Jesus. We're the ones who are to push back the darkness. We're the ones to uphold those in authority. And if we think they're not saved, let's pray for the Lord to save them. I pray for the Lord to save President Clinton every day. And if you think your Prime Minister is saved, I don't know anything about it. Then thank God. And pray God to give him wisdom and guidance, what to say and what decisions to make, and what appointments to make. Pray for your leaders. You are to govern. When I was in Haiti three years ago, and you know the trouble there is in Haiti, but maybe you're not aware on this side of the world as much about as we are on the other side. 
I was holding a prayer conference to several thousand Haitian Christians, believers, and I said to them, in whose hands is the future of Haiti? I said, not in the hands of prayer, President Aristide. Not in the hands of the army, the military. I said, the future of Haiti is in the hands of you who are sitting before me this morning, the church. According to your intercession will be the future of Haiti. If you reign with Christ, one thing can happen. If you fail to reign, don't expect God's will to be done. The Bible is very clear. We are to reign with Jesus. Others don't do it. When I was in Korea last fall, I said to them, I was speaking to over 2,200 pastors. I said, in whose hands is the future of Korea? It's not in the hands of North Korea. It's not in the hands of your military. I said, the future of Korea is in your hands, pastors, and in the hands of your congregations. If you teach them to intercede, if you teach them to reign with Christ, the future of any nation is in the hands of the, of the body of Christ. But the body of Christ is sitting with muted lips. They forget God's calling. Oh, God, help us to begin to reign with Jesus. The Bible is so clear. If, I, if you forget everything else I say and that I have written, Remember this, you are to reign with Jesus, and if you don't, I'm not saying you don't get to heaven, you'll get to heaven, but the reward you're going to have at the, at the judgment throne of Christ will be less than if you had fulfilled the role for which Christ redeemed you. Why were we created in the image of God? That we would have a very special role. Why are we the bride of Christ? That we should serve Christ today in a very special way, and that throughout eternity we should be the closest to God, the closest to the bridegroom, closer than the seraphim and cherub, closer than the archangels and the angels. We are to be the closest of all, and we today have the heaviest responsibility of all. God open our lips, God open our eyes, God help us to proclaim the priesthood of the people of God. We are to make a difference in our world. You are to make a difference in Tauranga. You are to make a difference in New Zealand. You are to make a difference in Russia, in India, in China. We are the intercessors with Christ. If I would ever say to you that God and I are co-workers, you say, what that tells you? Except the Bible says, we are laborers together with God. How much are you laboring with God? So we bow our heads. Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see the world as you see it. Give us a heart that hears your tug and feels your tug and hears your voice and your call. Teach us how to pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us to reign with Jesus. Lord, you've not only raised us with Christ, but you've raised us to seat us with Christ in the heavenlies. And we have sat so casually. We have sat with so little concern. We have sat without tears in our hearts or in our eyes. We have sat as though the world were not going to hell. The world that you so loved that you sent your only son. Oh Lord, give us that love. Give us that Christ-like love and give us to join Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the blessed Holy Spirit in a ministry of worldwide intercession, of nation-changing, of church-changing, of city-changing intercession, that we may reign with Jesus. Lord, don't let us forget it. Don't let us be careless. Lord, teach us to redeem moments, more moments, more moments for prayer, the kind of prayer that makes a difference in our world. We ask it all through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.